Hey listeners, thanks for listening and for supporting the Max Planck Florida's Neurotransmissions podcast. Behind the scenes, MPFI has a dedicated crew for communicating our outstanding science and engaging with the public, but this is only made possible because of your charitable giving. Please visit mpfi.org slash donate to support our science and our mission. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Max Planck Florida's Neurotransmissions Podcast. I'm Joe Schumacher, joined by my co-host, Dr. Leslie Colgan. How's it going, Leslie? Very good. How are you, Joe? Very good. It's been a whirlwind couple of weeks here at MPFI. Um, every couple of years, when there's not a pandemic going on, we love to put on a world-class neuroimaging course here at MPFI. It's open to graduate students and postdocs around the world. We bring in world-class imaging experts from all around the globe to share specialized expertise and technical details of how to implement a wide range of neuroimaging approaches from super resolution microscopy to uh, miniature microscopes for uh, in vivo imaging and behaving animals. Um, And this year is no exception. And today on the podcast, we're extremely thrilled to welcome uh, somebody who is um, rapidly becoming uh, a household name and the go-to guy for understanding how to study and image neural circuits in freely moving animals. Dr. Wei Jian Zong, for, uh, he's a research, research group leader from the Kavli Institute of Systems Neuroscience at uh, Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Dr. Zong, thank you so much for coming all the way to visit us and to be on the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, before we get started, um, in 2022, you uh, published a monumental paper from your postdoctoral work in um, uh, the Moser Lab um, at NTNU, um, which focused on large-scale two-photon imaging in freely moving animals um, using miniature miniature two-photon microscopes. And uh, it's taken off extremely rapidly. People all over the world are trying to implement this in-house. We know this specifically here because there's at least six research groups who are trying to implement mini 2P imaging in their labs right now. So uh, we couldn't have got you at a better time to come and talk about mini 2P stuff. Um, But I understand um, from your talk today that this isn't just a recent focus for you. This has actually been like you know, an entire scientific career's worth of focus stemming back to your to your bachelor's degree. So what was the first, uh, you know, hook for you um, understanding the potential power behind miniaturized two-photon imaging? Well, I think, the, yeah, I think, yes, I, in my talk, I showed that actually I really focus on this uh, technology since my undergraduate, like that's my 11 years. But if I really go back to the very, very uh, beginning of this story, it's, uh, it, it's kind of like random. And uh, um, so I was in the electrical engineering school in Peking University, so it's a very pure engineering school. But, uh, but actually, you know that uh, when I was in, uh, a kid, I, I, I feel like I want to be a scientist. But, but of course, it's a, it's a little bit uh, interesting that at that age, especially in my country, it's not a clearly distinction between engineer, uh, engineering or scientists. We always start, uh, co- talk uh, science technology. So that's why I, I, I want to learn technology because I think maybe, um, I mean, the scientists, they need to, they always need some unique tool they, mm-hmm. they, uh, for, for themselves. And, um, and um, uh, so that's the how we, we can get some new um, um, uh, uh, data and the new um, uh, directions in the science. But when I go to the engineering school, actually, I joined an, a lab who are doing laser to build up lasers. That's cool. That's a that's great uh, um, uh, labs. I, I learned how to build lasers. And this laser is particular femtosecond laser. Um, but uh, I, I was there. I, w- I, I was good. I, I did. Uh, I did some uh, good job. I make. I can. I learn. I know how to build lasers. But then I feel a little bored later because I feel that okay, I'm like um, an, an engineer and making some thing. And some people come to tell me, okay, this is the parameter you need. Make it work. I make it work. But uh, it's not like what I really uh, uh, I image myself when I tell. I want to be a person who can use the tools. I invite. Uh, I develop myself do something, to discover something. To discover something. Yes, yes. You see that this laser, usually that will be um, uh, asked for another lab or company or, or, 
or or some collaborators who want to use in this laser to do uh, to build up a more complex system. Laser is just the start. Usually in com- in microscope, that's just start. Mm-hmm. And then they say, oh, I need to I need to move on. I need to go. Uh, I want to go another place to see what people exactly using laser for. <laughs> right. And 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 that 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 is how uh, I meet my ex supervisor in Peking University, Erping Pisicheng. And and then and then um, I'm looking for a master uh, for bachelor thesis um, uh, project, and uh, he he just showed me a paper from uh, uh, this is this is paper Mark Senior's lab. They they in two uh, in 2009 they have this. And it's not a big paper, but it's it's a co- it's a great paper. They show that uh, they make a prototype, the miniature two photon uh, systems, and they say that wow, look this. I mean, um, this is something you can do. Think about it. And then I say, yeah, wow, this is great. I mean, at that time, I don't know what is two photo microscope. Mm-hmm. I started learning two photo microscope by reading this paper, who is already who tried to make a miniature two photo microscope. Mm-hmm. And they say, yes, yes, this should be something that uh, that that I can do. <laughs> I want to try. And that's a start. The start is really random. At that time, I was really, well, I was so far away from the real science, real neuroscientist. Mm-hmm. I don't know what people are going to do with it. But that's a start. At least that's a, that's an interest uh, uh, drag me from the pure engineering field to a field that make people making something that has a, some certain application in a specific field, which is neuroscience. So that's a start. Yeah. And uh, and it's not it doesn't work at the beginning. I just said I don't know even know know what is a two photon microscope. How could that system works? But uh, but uh, but I learned I learned from uh, this. I learned what is two photon. Uh, why two photon is important for 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 the uh, neuroscientists to do the to do the uh, uh, neural activity recording in mm-hmm. vivo. And and then I fell love in this uh, field itself. Not only the engineering. Because I always tell, uh, like as, as mm. I said, t- I talked this morning. I think, I think the most important thing is not knowing how it works, because uh, all the solution you have, no matter if that is uh, 20 years ago when people first tried the miniscope, or uh, the, the time that I tried to make it myself in my bachelor, or the solution we prepared now, they're all temporal uh, solution. Yeah. If you see after 10 years, this, this engineer solution will always pass, but the question is there. The important thing is that you know uh, uh, what is the question you want to uh, ask with these tools, and you know why it's important. As far as you convince yourself these are important questions, then things just go through itself. It, it's a very obvious, like, uh, if we, we need this thing, we have to have this thing, because that's, only, that's the only way we can do the... To ask specific yeah, exactly. questions. Yeah, exactly. So, so maybe we could, you know, talk a little bit about your perspective on the, the, the sort of pivotal role that two-photon imaging specifically has played in neuroscience, maybe in the last, you know, two to three decades or so, w- when it's become a very, you know, popular tool to implement. So the standard like wide field epifluorescence microscope is good for looking at large areas of neural tissue and fluorescent indicators that are tagged to, you know, specific proteins or something in the in the brain. Um, you can get better resolution and, you know, a much crisper image at, at, a, at a finer spatial scale yeah. with confocal imaging because you're able to like eliminate um, you know, out of focus light essentially in your sample. Yeah. And then with two photon imaging and the advent of calcium indicators, for instance, or voltage sensitive um, genetically encoded sensors of various proxies of neural activity, yeah. you can image deeper into tissue with no out of focus light and with high spatial resolution, basically by scanning a laser over the tissue. So for you, mm-hmm. the hook to the neuroscience or the intro was like just building lasers. It was like, yeah. like here's the technology. And then finding a good application for it, you found, oh, there's this whole universe of interesting questions to ask about how the yeah. brain works if we had the right tools. What were some of the fundamental limitations? You mentioned like the earliest version you worked on didn't mm-hmm. really pan out. What were like the technical limitations that made it so that um, essentially what you want is this thing mounted, you know, in a sort of non-invasive way to an animal so that they can go about their business while you record brain activity? Like what what prevented that early on? Mm-hmm. Well, I think I would say that to miniaturize the system, like um, no no matter is the miniature two photo microscope or miniature three photo microscope or whatever like a, a compact system, it's it's just an art of a, a sacrifice, uh, sacrification. Mm-hmm. So you cannot achieve everything inside. 
um, because uh, that is uh, limited for physics. So I think the fundamental um, uh, 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 limitation of the early um, uh, um, uh, uh, versions came to from two perspectives. The one perspective is the indicator, because the early, uh, uh, in the earlier time, earlier we, we say like two, 20 years ago, actually indicator that people uh, can use to, to transfer the neural activity from the electronic signal to the optical signal it's n it was not optimized. Like uh, they are not bright enough they have a very strong baseline signal, which means the dynamic range is really low. Um, and it's not very uh, photostable that uh, it can only be imaged for a few seconds and then they just uh, be degraded, bleached. So all of them actually make this emergent of, uh, f uh, for, for the uh, system engineering or the microscopics to make their system uh, usable very small, which means you have to make everything exactly extremely good uh, it's like a good alignment, extremely high NA, high resolution, high detection efficiency to get a, 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 a little bit increase of the signal. That makes things a, a lot very hard. So that's the emergent, right? You do not have too much space to play. You do not have too much space to sacrifice mm -hmm. in c and to gain uh, some uh, some parameter that you cannot sacrifice. So basically to get the right image, you, you can't implement the right optical configuration like sure. in the small space basically yeah because yeah. Uh, just just not, not you cannot make everything work uh, as bench top when you put them in a so small space so then what changed like what changed over the last 10 years or so so changed one change well one, one thing changed so that's indicator so the new generation new indicator they are much much brighter much uh, more stable and uh, they have so low um uh, 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 base uh, baseline uh, signal so which means that uh, we can sacrifice starting to sacrifice something for example we can sacrifice a little bit of the resolution and uh, to gain much more space to decreasing the size of the element and uh, so so that uh, so that opened a lot of doors people started to be very creative because they do not how to, because you know the golden two for the scope structure is there and that's the optimized one. If you do not obey that structure, you lose the resolution, mm -hmm. you lose field of view. And because uh, people do not have space to play, they, do, they are not creative because they cannot change anything. Any change will, will crash, the signal crash. But now you see that all different people starting to create a different structure because all of the works seems all of that could work. So that's one thing. The second thing I would say that uh, this field really benefit from the industry, uh, the development in the industry, like cell phone, you know, basic cell phone is a miniaturized version of computer now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also, it's a miniature, your cell phone now have a great uh, camera that can only that could only be treated with uh, big lenses component before. That's right. So we benefit from them. So, for example, there's one very important element who can, we can do very fast, very stable focusing cha focus changing. That was the element of this company in Norway developed by cell phone before, maybe 10, five years ago. And we realized that, that, that it can be used in miniature microscope and it works perfectly, right? Also this MAP scanner, that's right. also another key element. I mean, this idea has been there for 20, 30 years. When I was bachelor, uh, I got undergraduate students and we learned this, what is MAM, MAM scanner is. That's a tiny silicon based devices. You can do a lot of cool things. But at that time, it, so this, this is just uh, um, 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 an idea that people can, can, can use. But uh, the only explosion is recent years, people starting to um, develop this autopilot system that you need a leader into scan environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to, to, to guide a car to drive automatically, or you have this uh, AR or VR uh, lens that you want to project uh, some pattern on your brain. Also, that's a big yeah. market. Mm -hmm. And this market uh, motivated the industry to develop better MAM scanner, better control mechanism, and, uh, and they are willing to uh, have different uh, type of MAMS uh, development. And then we just uh, take use of this knowledge and uh, transfer into our basic research. And that is only happened in the last 10 years. Year. I would say from these two sides, they converged in about 20, 20, 2015, 2017. Interesting. It gave us a lot of resources that we can use to make a miniature two-form microscope. The same could real, could real be used in neuroscience. 
So the application, oh, go ahead, Leslie. So in the last 10 years, you've had these like incredible advancements um, yes. in this technology that have really allowed you to come up with your latest sort of, um, what, what is named Mini 2P, correct? Yeah. <laughs> your yeah. latest version. So maybe we could talk a little bit about, you know, what this, what sort of the technical specifications, what it's capable of doing. So yes. like, how much does it weigh? Yeah, yeah. So I think I, I, I how to um, um, add one uh, comment. Sure. It's not only because the a new emerged technology, because the, there are two, one or two key component that was developed in the last year, last few years, then allowed us to revisit a lot of technology that was developed to the like three, 30 years ago, because then we realized, okay, that thing now works, then why not we bring that thing in? Because mm -hmm. then this thing put together can be worked. So that's how Mini2P works. So Mini2P, so the most important thing people ask is how heavy it is. It's about two to three gram. Depends on what, uh, how you make it, how you mount it on, on, on the head of a mouse. I would say it's probably about, for the folks at home, about the size of Yes. This end of yeah. this pen right here. Yeah. It's like very small. Yeah. Yeah. So like, like uh, it's like a finger's uh, um, size. Yeah. Uh, mini uh, microscope. And in this microscope, what we integrated, we integrate a um, tunable lens, as I mentioned, that was uh, developed in Norway, that can help us to image in different uh, layers of the brain. So basically, uses a, a, a command voltage to change the focal point. That's right. So you can image deep or shallow in That's the tissue, right. basically. Yeah. And then we have this MAP scanner. Mm -hmm. It's a very tiny 2D scanner that is used to scan the focus in 2D pattern. So on a normal large tabletop two photon yeah. microscope, conventionally people might have like a resonant mirror and a galvo. That's and right. Basically you're using a combination of mirrors in a large box yeah. to focus the beam because you have to scan over Yeah, you area. have to reconstruct to the image from a single focal point. Then but, you need to scan it. But the MEMS then is like a small mirror kind of on a two axis gimbal that kind of yes. like has like some freedom of movement. Yes, it's very yes. tiny. Yeah, yeah, it's very tiny. The size of the this MEMS chirp, uh, it's about four millimeter times four millimeter. So that's um, very tiny. And the thickness is usually a hundredth micrometer. Yeah. And that can do the thing you do with this big uh, box. It's crazy. And then we have um, some um, optical elements that um, that is very detailed. I just want to uh, just give a brief picture. You need to focus, uh, uh, expand it, collimate it, so it has some optical systems. And one key element is this miniature um, uh, objective. And this objective at an early uh, age, like in 2017, we're using a commercialized objective that is uh, may, um, uh, that was constructed by maybe one or two lenses. It's very simple uh, components. And uh, in the latest version, mean to p we have this customized objective. It's only three millimeter diameter and about 10 millimeter uh, uh, um, lens, but they have about 10 lenses inside. Mm. All of the tiny lenses, all of the well designed, we know that we want to achieve the similar uh, uh, quality as a big objective. And that's also the same thing like your phone. You, you can consider that like 10 years ago, your phone lens is not good enough. It's only have one or two elements. But now your phone lens, they're fantastic. They have do a great job. That's exactly the path, actually, the mean to P, how, be, uh, uh, how it was evolved to here. And then we have, um, uh, we have two fibers. That's also very important. One fiber is the, uh, uh, the fiber that we need to delete the laser into the scope. Mm -hmm. That's also a key element. And uh, this idea to using this specific type of fiber, which we call the holocker fiber, already suggested uh, 20 years ago. But because this fiber was designed for telecom, for, 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 for the optical um, mm -hmm. industry, actually they didn't realize that this fiber can be used in, the, uh, uh, in neuron science to do calcium imaging. So they didn't design and didn't prepare this fiber with the right wavelengths that we can use for mm -hmm. the new indicator I mentioned. Yeah, so and like, uh, you know, 980 nanometer light, basically. Sure. Yeah. So, so basically, this, this fiber we can use in eight nano, uh, 800 nanometer. That's a little bit lower uh, wavelength, and it can be used in high, uh, 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 longer wavelengths, like uh, say that 1.5 uh, mm -hmm. a micron. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, if anybody knows telecom, that's the wavelength they want. Mm. But they just not know uh, that it just doesn't work in 920, which is exactly the wavelength we, we need for right. neuroscience. And it's make us so hard to convince the company to, okay, 
Please make it because we need it. Because there's like a hundred people <laughs> who want to yeah do this. Yeah, that's true. Mouse, that's like, a problem. Yeah. Basic science, you know. We, I when every time I go to the uh, neuroscience conference, like SFN offense, I see thousand people. So I was oh, there's so many people are doing neuroscience. This is the biggest uh, field in science. That's great. I'm so excited. I was in big family. But if you talk to this industry um, <laughs> people, say we have maybe probably hundreds labs that can can use it. They don't care, right? Because yeah. uh, <laughs> countries for them is is a tiny number. Yeah, they, they want they want millions. They want right. millions. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like a phone, they they make one lens for ma million. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of theory dating back multiple decades had to sort of go through some development and then converge to make this latest iteration of the Mini Two P possible. Mm -hmm. Now it's um, it's incredibly, um, you know, it's surprisingly simple to implement partially due to, well, in, entirely due to the fact that you've done extensive documentation and, you know, calibration and testing protocols, and you've developed workshops to build these things. Uh, you're inviting people over to learn the technology. Um, anybody with um, some money in the bank account and enough uh, time and interest in answering the types of questions you can use with it can now do this basically out of the box too, because there are vendors that are now starting to sell, you know, prefabricated versions of the Mini 2P and stuff. So the other component of this whole thing is that you've, you know, insisted on making this a very open source sure. project. Um, now, because of the demand, it makes it adds this other challenge because now the entire world wants to, you know, we talked about the hundred people who might be in that niche field that want to use it. But now that you've demonstrated how good it is, everybody wants to be in on it. Mm -hmm. What are some of the challenges that go with really trying to push hard on the open science aspect of um, the project? And, you know, what have you learned along the way about, you know, the, the sort of symbiotic relationship between commercial vendors and experimental biologists? Like, what are some of the lessons you've learned trying to basically give this to the world essentially for free? Well, I think all of them relate to that's a good question. I think I, I still do not have the uh, the best answer yet because I'm still um, trying to find a path how to spread this technology much easier, much better, much faster. Uh, I do see the challenge. Uh, I think this challenge not only from uh, uh, related to our project, but all the open source, open not even not open all the new technology. When you see this in the paper, it's excited, it's exciting. But after two, four, three years. People say, okay, it's too difficult to apply, and uh, I could just give up. Hmm. I want to hmm. go back to the old technology. So I think it's, it came from motivation. You know, that uh, I, I think I, 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 I'm a pure uh, like technology development uh, mentor, and I'm focusing on doing research. This research, both on the scientific question and the research for how to make a new system, that is, uh, new tools. So our, our motivation is. We, we are eager to see new discoveries that came out from this technology. And uh, there are so many technology, there are so many paths you could choose, but you, you really know what you want to do with it. So that's our motivation. That's why I came to Norway, uh, stay in an institute that the, all the people around us are neuroscientists. They give uh, me a lot of inspira uh, inspiration. They tell me what they need, what they're leaking. And they tell me that the, why this question is so fundamental and we cannot address it just because we do not have right tools. So that kind of uh, 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 motivation is much, I think it's even more important than the knowledge of technique itself. Because as far as I, as you know, that the question you need to uh, uh, ask is important, is fundamental. You will find the solution sooner or later. I think that 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 that's, I, I never thought that we can not solve it. Because if we cannot solve it, then we, we can't move on. We have to do that. Right. But the motivation is so important, and um, and uh, but I don't think this conflict. I think open source, we want to push it as open source. I want every uh, researcher, they can make their own tool so they can use the tool they make themselves to do research. It's not conflicted with the industry, like with the commercialization, because you know, this is a new technology. One problem, you know, that's why industry doesn't want to jump in because the ecosystem is not built. Mm -hmm. We do not have enough users to motivate them to make. Right. 
So, but the the, the neuroscientists, they already be, their life is already very hard. Yeah. They saw so many things like uh, uh, like surgery, like uh, questions, like computations, like like, like all the. Um, I mean, imaging is one particular very difficult uh, field. Uh, tech and text the technology in neuroscience, you also need to do the very injection. And and all of these things make a neuroscientist life very hard. You have to know all of it, basically. They, and yeah. if you say, "Hey, this is a new technology, and uh, it may help your research, may not," but it seems like cool, you should uh, 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 just stop what you are doing now, shift to a new technology, spend maybe your whole po PhD or postdoc testing something you don't know if that works, and or you don't know, you you can have nobody else talk talk to. You don't know if it works in other labs. They don't want to go jump in. They were very hesitated. And that makes the whole field very small. And that's, that's a problem because that's a problem for us. If we want to uh, convince people to use it, we do not have a good example. And if we want to publish papers of using the technology, the reviewer always challenges us. Oh, this is new technology. It's not uh, it's established not yet. It's yeah. not proof yet. Mm -hmm. I, show me, show me this, show me that. So that's why we started, okay, let's do this. We do our research, but we also start to have a, uh, try to make it as simple as possible, as easy as possible. So we, 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 we start to build up this ecosystem so people can believe this is, this is a, a useful thing, and it is not all useful, but it has a potential to become a more general or standard tools. For example, if you're using Confocal to do the research, no, no reviewer will challenge you. Right, and that's course. our dream. Uh, that's our dream. We want to have a technology that can be standardized, and people will just say, okay, of course you should use it. This is the way to go. So, so for, you know, to summarize, it's kind of like your open source you know, project here is essentially to reduce the um, barrier to entry for like early adopters. Yes, and also yeah. expanded the, the 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 audience, expanded the the users, and actually eventually, the industry, our our uh, industry partners or or the people who 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 support the element or component of this technology, they are also very happy, because for them. They want to make something. They want to invest in their money and energy to something that they know there are more and more people can use, and not only using one this year, but maybe in the next ten year. And they, of course, they cannot uh, uh, um, generate uh, the user themselves because that's very hard. And we do this job already, and now we have more and more users. I think uh, that I think it's a win-win. I think that's uh, I, that's uh, it's, it's a great example. I hope I hope actually uh, more and more uh, project like this should uh, also appear. Yeah, well, I think the community is thankful for <laughs> your perspective on this. Um, so what's next for the Mini 2P? Do you think there's still additional challenges that you want to tackle, or are you moving towards new technologies? Uh, yeah, I think uh, for the Mini 2P itself, um, we still have um, a lot of things need to be improved. From the technology itself, we of course that we want to further increasing the, the the cell yield so we can get more and more uh, neurons because now we can got one thousand neurons but how many neurons you have in the brain that's millions and and and, and so we, we we still can only get a small piece of the brain we want to increase in the field of view we want to get it with it much faster because now the speed is designed for calcium imaging which is uh, very slow, uh, uh, um, low pass filtered uh, signal of your neural activity. Your neuron talk to each other with one millisecond signal, but we can only achieve hundreds of millisecond or one second time resolution. We want to push that direction to, to, to the resolution that we can see single spike. And the other thing is that uh, we, of course, miniaturization is not, um, you know, we, no one know what, how light means miniatur miniaturization. We, we decrease the size from, hundreds of kilograms to two gram, but still there's a lot of space in the small, in this uh, under it. Like we want to push the further smaller. So the smaller animals like fish, like birds, uh, like other animals, they can carry it. So we can expand it, the, 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 uh, the capability to, to understand the brain in different species. We can also, we also want to maybe record multi-brain areas to, uh, to see how they cooperate to, hmm. to operate a function. 
So that's direction. But the other direction, I still think that uh, it's very great that you say that now it's a, like a turnkey solution that people can uh, use it. But uh, but um, we're just beginning. We, we definitely will uh, see a lot of trouble came out when the people are starting to use it daily. Um, things can broken and how the people could solve this problem. Could mm -hmm. it replace it or is it fixed? And, uh, and, uh, or how we can uh, 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 connect, uh, uh, adapt this technology to a bigger picture because there are also other fantastic um, technology in this field, like, uh, for example, the photo stimulation, for example, EM reconstruction, uh, single cell transcranial, and mm -hmm. we, 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 we how to, because the the information you can uh, extract with a single modality is very small. Even we got a lot of information knowledge from this technology, but we want to this to integrate it with other uh, information that we get from other fantastic te technology and how we can link them together, how we can uh, share the knowledge we get from different modality. That's also one direction I want to push. So it's kind of like the correlative light EM approach where you take like imaging from different modalities and sort of co-register it together. Is that sort of what you're thinking? Yeah, that, 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 that's, uh, that's, that's an, an easy, example. It's an, not an easy problem. Yeah, right? that's an example. Mm -hmm. That's an example. Uh, and also to extend it, the, the thing we promised <laughs> to, to really convince, the, to show that, for example, with two photo microscope, you say that we can do multiple layer a study. We can see different uh, um, uh, um, brain uh, um, regions, and we can see different uh, structures, subcellular structures, spine, dendrite. Uh, uh, so, and uh, there are some uh, uh, sparse uh, uh, work that come out to say that we can do this, but uh, but uh, what, uh, but we uh, we haven't really fully explored this capability, and to really show that uh, we uh, we when we uh, can see much diverse the information from dendrite to spine, different cell types from the uh, cell that project from different areas, how that can tell us. Like, uh, so that uh, we need to know, fundamentally we want to understand the brain and how this information can guide us to uh, understand the brain. And I hope that I can push that direction too. Very cool. Well, we're just about out of time. Um, I was wondering, so now you have your own research group that you're running. Um, what has that transition been like um, now that you're sort of developing your own lab? And also, there's a lot of people who listen to this podcast who are, you know, uh, aspiring graduate students and postdocs and that sort of thing. So are you looking to bring people onto your team at this time? What, yeah. what do you look for in people who could who could you know, contribute to using this technology. In Any kind of people. As, as I say that, you know, like I'm engineering, but when I talk to the students, I, I, I as I say that, so don't, uh, at the beginning, don't think about the technology. Don't think at the start, say, okay, is it softable? Um, 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 uh, is it technically possible? You think about if this question is important. And that means that I I I'm, I want every kinds of people and f bring idea from different perspectives. It's a very disciplinary uh, lab. We want the people who do the engineering. We do uh, need people to do the physics. To we need people to do the biology, suggest biology questions. We need people who are expert in doing experiment. And be uh, we need people who know how to communicate, not communicate, how to how to how to um, interact with the animals. And we also need the people who build models. I think, uh, um, and, and I think the diversity is a key uh, um, uh, um, uh, element to make the lab success. And and that's and also the the diversity is the only way we can do neuroscience because neuroscience need every, all of them. Mm -hmm. And for myself, it's very clear that this lab will be a question driven technology development lab. We develop technology because that's how we, uh, I uh, grow uh, I uh, I arrived here but so every technology I'm going to develop it, I think we need to be very clear what question we want to uh, address why we want this technology and that's the uh, key slogan in, in in the lab and I'm happy to talk to anybody who want to come to my lab and come to Norway Norway is a very beautiful country and and the lifestyle is quite uh, different from here but uh, but I believe that uh, uh, you will enjoy it uh, <laughs> there that's awesome well thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today it's yeah. been a pleasure talking to you yeah it's been really you. great to meet you the last couple of weeks and uh, best of luck on the the rest of this uh, amazing journey thank you thank you so much thank you yeah
As always, thank you for listening to Max Planck Florida's Neurotransmissions Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to help support the podcast, please subscribe and tell your friends.